Well, good evening, brethren and sisters. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you all for coming tonight. Now, you might be well aware that um, there's been a few changes this week with our COVID plans, um, which we would have heard about, and also a special announcement tonight as well, um, regard this afternoon by the Premier regarding um, a few other changes. I'll be going through a few of those at the end of the meeting, just to go through a few of the details. But one of the key things which has happened is that we have been um, advised that we cannot sing as a community, as a religious group, in the hall. Um, and so what I'm going to be trialling for tonight is I've actually got our opening hymn as a hymn up on the um, overhead. And so that way we'll be able to listen to the words of that and enjoy that. And then after that, I'll ask you to stand for prayer as we open our meeting together that way. So we'll just start with our opening hymn. you praise, glory and honour. We recognise you as the only true God and we are so thankful that you do look on us as your children. And Father, at this time, we are very thankful that we have this opportunity to meet together. We especially realise that there are some others, even in this country right now, who cannot do the same as we do because of lockdown. So we're very thankful for this time that we do have together to read from your word and to think about the example given of your son. We ask that you will be with our meeting and bless us, help us to have understanding of your words and the ability to apply it into our lives. Help us also to, as an ecclesia, work together so that we can 
be able to give each other comfort, to encourage each other, and sometimes to exhort each other to find better ways to do what we can so that we can be better children for you. Father, at this time we are very mindful of all your children around the world in very difficult circumstances in some place, and we do pray that your blessing will be on them. And we pray more earnestly that you will send your son soon to set up the kingdom, which we know will be the end of all troubles. And we do look for that time, and we praise you now in our coming King's name, Lord and Saviour, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We are continuing in our studies with uh, Philippians, and so to introduce the words of our brother Tim Badger tonight, um, I'll read for you from Philippians and chapter 3. Philippians 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the ecclesia, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you about and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself." So, with that as an introduction, um, we'll have a talk, which is just an audio talk, but it does have PowerPoint slides to go with it, from Brother Tim Badger. Now, this was given at a youth conference in 2017 in Perth, so he will refer to us as young people quite frequently, so 
you're only as young as you feel and I think it will help us feel a lot younger that way. So um, in instruction with this, I did try and get in touch with Tim to see if he would be available to actually give the talk himself, but unfortunately he's planning on travelling. I don't know how that's gone because they were looking at going to Queensland. But we have now this talk which we can enjoy together tonight. Thanks, Brother John. Verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, there's an element of finality about that, probably because he uses the word finally, but it, it sort of feels like, well, I've just told you this, this description of the Lord Jesus Christ and his humility and his example, and then I've showed you, and hopefully this came up in your discussion groups um, yesterday, I've just showed you how Timothy and Epaphroditus are living current examples of what Jesus Christ demonstrated in his sacrifice, right? So I've, I've showed you how Christ shows you example, and then I've showed you how two brethren in your ecclesia are demonstrating that right now by giving their lives and their concern and their care for your development. So it's just a really powerful chapter and all of those things concerning Christ and then Timothy and Epaphroditus and Paul himself. And then he saw, he, after that, he says in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, I, I just want you to rejoice. I'm coming back to that theme. This is reason to rejoice. All that Christ has done, all of his example for us and the power that that can have in our lives and the demonstration that you see in Timothy and Epaphroditus, this gives us reason to rejoice. Now, I'm just going to stop there because yesterday we looked at the idea um, that Paul his headset is in the servant prophecies of Isaiah. What chapters does that include, by the way? If you remember from yesterday. Servant prophecies of Isaiah include chapters what to what? Do you remember? 40 to 66. Good. So, so chapter 40 starts off with John crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Messiah, and, and away you go. So those chapters are particularly in his mind. He quotes from it in chapter 2. He's alluded to the sufferings of Christ in chapter 53 and 49, and, and he's quoted the idea that Christ is a bondservant that came straight from the servant prophecies and everything else. But there's something else going on in Philippians, young people, and if you haven't seen this, it's so exciting. And it adds a whole other element of exhortation for us uh, today in particular. You know, obviously, I think we would all agree from looking at Philippians that Philippians is just such a positive letter. Okay? That goes without saying. We all know that. And it's so many times you come to this theme of rejoicing, which makes me think, where, why? Why is Paul in this zone? I mean, I, I get it. He's focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation through him. He's excited and moved by that. And he's rejoicing in their unity and the fellowship in the gospel. But from a, from a headset, where is Paul's mind? Well, young people, if you, and this is what I did, I just sat down and asked this little simple question and it led to an enormous um, amount of excitement for me and exhortation. If you ask the question, where else in scripture do you find such a concentration of joy? Well, that leads to a really interesting answer. I mean, Philippians, we would say, is the happiest book of the New Testament. Well, what's the happiest book of the Old Testament? It's totally, by far and away, without any comparison, the book of Isaiah. Absolutely. Wait, what did you... <laughs> what did you just say? Did you say Isaiah? Oh, okay. <laughs> that is such a good answer, but... <laughs> oh man no that is but can I tell you something I, I love the book of Psalms and clearly you do too um, actual fact there is joy in rejoicing in Psalms but over two thirds of the Psalms are lament Psalms did you know that? we sort of think Psalms is the place where you go for happy and joy but actually when you go there that's true it's definitely there in a, a lot more than other places in scripture but when you go to Psalms a lot of what you find is people sad and lamenting and pouring out the heart to God, saying, I don't understand what you're doing in my life. Please help me. So that's true. But Isaiah is way more than Psalms. Now, I want to show you. Just, just recap briefly the servant prophecies, because we're just dealing with this phrase again, rejoice in the Lord. Um, here's how it works. Um, 
And I'll put these, or Dave will put these on the website if, if you want to scratch it down later. Chapters 40 to 48 are generally understood as chapters relating to Israel's deliverance, so promised redemption. 49 to 57 is talking about Israel's deliverer, the Christ, the Messiah, right? Redemption provided and how that's going to work. The atonement, chapter 53 is in there, all those. 58 to 66 is Israel and the world delivered through that Messiah, right? And that's redemption realized. And it's all about salvation, righteousness, the Messiah. That's the servant prophecies and how they, how they sort of work and how they're structured. But when we come to this idea of joy that I was saying about, rejoicing in Isaiah, it is intense in the servant prophecies. And I've never, ever noticed that before. Think about this, right? In the book of Isaiah alone, and I've, I've gone through the, every single word and tried to suss this out and make sure, there are 13 different words in Hebrew used by the prophet Isaiah for joy and rejoicing. 13 different words, right? Now, it's 85 times in the book of Isaiah, and 43 of those uses of the words rejoicing or joy are in the servant prophecies. So well over half of the occurrences are in less than half of the book, the servant prophecies. So why are they there? What's, why, why is Isaiah the happiest book in the Old Testament? And it's so descriptive. It, he's, he's used a plethora of words to describe the joy. 13 different Hebrew words, 85 times. Why so happy? Why is that the place you find so much rejoicing? It's exactly the same reason why Paul is on that theme in Philippians. Sorry, Johnny? Exactly. That is the bottom line. The, the, the whole point about rejoicing in Isaiah, and especially the servant prophecies, is you are finding the greatest, deepest joy because of this. The deliverance of Israel and the world through Christ the Messiah. The, the people that are, the pictures that are painted in these chapters of people are so profoundly joyous. It's amazing. And I just want to show you one word, okay? There's 13. We're not going to go through all of them today. Um, this morning, I want to show you one of those words that links to the story of the Philippian Ecclesia. Here's one word out of the 13. It's the Hebrew word gil. And it literally means, in Hebrew, to spin around in circles, to do a revolution. Okay, and I'm not going to do that on the stage. I tried it once, and it came across fairly awkward, so <laughs> we won't be doing that. But... That's what it means. The Hebrew word is to literally spin around in circles. And these are all the times it occurs. Here's the servant prophecies in purpley, whatever, 41 to 66. But all these in orange are also related to deliverance in the Messiah. You know, Isaiah chapter 9, unto us the son is born. That's Christ. Chapter 25 is a prophecy of redemption to the Messiah, 29, 35. What's 35 verse 1? Top of your head. What is it? Yep, kingdom passage, right? The desert shall... Rejoice and blossom as the rose. I think that's roughly what it says. Yeah. So think about that. Now I'm going to read you some of the verses with a literal translation of the Hebrew for this word rejoicing. Chapter 41. I'm just going to read off the top of my head. Is that okay? Because we'll save a little bit of time. 41 verse 14. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, and thou shalt spin around in circles in the Lord and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. Chapter 49. Sing, O heavens, dance in circles, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people. He will have mercy on his afflicted. 61 verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Do you see what this? That is exactly why Paul is so full of rejoicing in, Isaiah, in, in Philippians. His head is completely in the Messiah prophecies of Isaiah, and he can't hold back the joy. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be dancing around for my God. For he clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Now, the interesting thing is, young people, that, that is a very physical word in the sense of this is describing a, a, a person who's understanding the Messiah and moved to dance in circles. But Paul uses a different concept of joy in Philippians. The joy he's talking about is not like a dancing around, like in circles, whatever, sorry, that was awkward. But 
um, his, his, his word for joy is actually this inner sense of absolute uh, joy. Okay, but it's inside. It, it, this sense of realization of the true salvation we have through Christ, and nothing's going to hold you back from, from, from being so happy in that. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't explain this outward appearance. Now, listen to this. The answer to the question is, well, why is that the case? But first of all, let's think about the story of Acts 16. When the jailer was baptized, what did he do? He rejoiced. That word is not the same word Paul uses in Philippians. The word for rejoice means to jump up and down. The the Philippian jailer. I'm telling you, if you were there at that night after an earthquake, back at the jailer's house with his family, Paul and Silas, and there was a baptism after the preaching of the word went on, they were not sitting in their seats. They were jumping for joy. Because this whole man and his household have had an entire foundation removed and a new one put in place. Their family was so excited in the very sense of Isaiah, the dancing in circles. I'm confident that that's what was happening. What else could you do? This is salvation through the Messiah. His whole life has been changed and he's jumping for joy. Now, now let's think about that. When Paul comes to Philippians, he doesn't keep telling us, just keep jumping for joy. My brother in verse 3, finally my brother, just jump for joy. Okay, And probably the reason for that is it's almost impossible to jump for joy as many times as Paul says in the letter to Philippians. Okay? It, it's physically impossible to just like come on Sunday morning every memorial meeting and just be spinning around in circles. That's obviously not going to quite uh, work from a physical point of view. But he's saying that that jumping for joy, that was a, and you always find that, by the way, in the context of the act of deliverance, when people experience, they come out of the Red Sea, off they go. They're so happy rejoicing. But this Paul saying, 10 years on from this ecclesia, the feeling of joy is no less. It's just not necessarily manifested in that way, but the intensity is still there. By the way, both have a place in redemption in Christ, don't they? But the ultimate end is this feeling inside you that cannot be moved, that you rejoice in the Lord because of all that's been done. Finally, young people, Rejoice in the Lord and feel that for all of its worth and all of the force of that coming from the servant prophecies of Isaiah. It's amazing. And just like that, the Apostle Paul turns the entire tone of this letter to something completely different. He turns and he says, Beware of the dogs! Now, the force of this is really hard to explain. The Greek, all of the, the feeling of the Greek language and the tenses and the way it's written is 180 degrees suddenly different when you read verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. And beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now I want to show you the force of how Paul's the, the Greek changes, and um, I'm not an expert in Greek, but this is what I've come across, and I want to show you this. Don't write down all these, but Paul uses at least four figures of speech or literary devices to catch the audience. Now remember, they'd be listening to this read out in front of them, and suddenly, from going to nice Timothy and Epaphroditus and the amazing example, suddenly the audience would be like, whoa, and maybe even on the edge of their seats, the way he does this. He uses a sudden repetition of the same word. Beware, beware, beware in a very short space. He uses a play on words that sounds similar. Mutilation and circumcision are are very similar, but they're different words. And the audience hearing this would have been, whoa, that's a really, like a really stark contrast. He uses alliteration. The words dog, dogs, evildoers, and mutilation all begin with this harsh K sound. Kion, kakos, katotome, or whatever that was. But... The, the, as an audience, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that this would have been a real kind of jolt in terms of the letter of the Apostle Paul being read out. He's serious. And he also uses a chiasm, which is uh, a device that's commonly found in Scripture that gives an emphasis on a particular contrast or a particular point. Rejoice in the Lord at the start of verse uh, 1 there. And then he, he contrasts false mutilation to this true circumcision, worshiping God through works or through the Spirit, and 
rejoicing in the Lord again. And the audience would have caught um, all, if not um, most of those devices that he, that he uses. Now, young people, this is something that we've got to take on board. It's, a, it's an anomaly in the letter to Philippians. It's something that Paul, and I, uh, this is why I put those on the screen partly, I want you to feel the passion and the angst in the heart of the Apostle Paul as he turns and has something to say about this matter. And you're going to feel it as we go through. What he is going to tell you and I is something so important that it is a matter of the difference between knowing Christ and not knowing Christ. What Paul is going to go on to describe to us in, a, in, a, in a two sides, really, is going to make the difference, young people, whether as you grow in the truth, you will listen and understand what Paul is saying about Jesus Christ, or you will, and I will never come to grips with it. He is so passionate in this little, this little section of the letter because he knows if we don't listen to what he has to say now, it will destroy every bit of progress that we are making in the faith. It will get absolutely in the way of us really, truly coming to grips with who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Now, he starts off by saying how he used to be in the past. You know the little description, and you're going to be able to unpack this, I'm sure, more in your discussion groups. But look what it says. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. And there's the first problem that he's going to talk about. Though one of the big stumbling blocks for you as a young person growing up, and, and us as older brothers and sisters, anyone for that matter, anyone who has confidence in the flesh, that will get in the way of you knowing truly who Christ is. Confidence in the flesh is one of the great enemies of Jesus Christ. And he did have confidence in the flesh, young people. Man, did he have confidence. Look what he says. All these things. We're not going to pick them all apart. Just a couple. Verse 5, he says, circumcised the eighth day. Actually, in the Greek, it's, it's got no verb. He, he's kind of touting this as a, as a really intense resume. And he, literally in the Greek, it says, about, regarding circumcision, I'm an eighth dayer. Now, not many people could claim that. That's, uh, circumcision was meant to be done on the eighth day, but not everyone is able to do that, especially if you're a convert into the truth. Paul says, you want to talk about circumcision? I was the eighth dayer. Absolutely perfect with regard to the expectations of the law of Moses. Now, he also says I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And this is one that I thought, well, okay, what's so special about Benjamin? Well, did a little bit of research, and this is why Benjamin was touted as something valuable to be part of as a tribe. Look at this. Benjamin was from Jacob's favorite wife. Uh, Benjamin also was the only son born in the promised land. Now imagine that. What tribe are you from, Asher? I'm from Benjamin. A little bit more of a connection to the promised land. Right? Like, that, that's what happened. The Jews had this mind of, like, I'm Benjamin. You're just Gad. Who knows about Gad? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's how it was, though. The Jews had worked themselves into this. this like, the Pharisees worked themselves into say, having things that they could hold against other people that made them special in a spiritual way. Obviously, they were wrong. But that's what they were holding out. Tribe specially loved by Yahweh, we're told in Deuteronomy 33. First anointed king came from this tribe, and, just so you don't miss it, the Apostle Paul had exactly the same name as the first king. Pretty special. Jerusalem and the temple were in its borders. That's amazing, and that was definitely a, a source of pride. Benjamin and Judah were at the core of the new returned exiles, so they were the most spiritual ones, right? Ernest. Held a special post of honor in the army, and, of course, the, form, the famous Mordecai was from this tribe who basically saved the entire nation. Now, that's where Paul's coming from. And we could pick through all these, and we don't want to overdo it. I don't think Paul really wants us to dwell on this too much, but he's very clearly telling us where his mind was at before he had the Damascus Road experiments and his education after that. So, Paul says, all these things were amazing to me. Young people, I, in fact, he doesn't say they were bad things. He said that all these things that, that I thought were gain were, are now lost. I, I was so proud of myself. I was amazing. I really, truly was. I kept everything external that you could ever want me to keep, and no one could find anything against me. Perfection. But now he says, and uh, we just have to be careful with this, but I'm telling you, young people, Paul uses colorful language here. 
He doesn't always, but this time he does. And he says, all those things that were outward, that were status, that puffed up my pride, that made me a little bit judgmental of other people, I now count them as excrement. That's the word he uses. Dung. New King James says rubbish. Bah, it's way more powerful than that. Everyone knows and realizes that Paul is using a very strong word. Close to our word for poo. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that irreverently, whatever, but if I'm only going to say that because I know that's what Paul is thinking. It's, he's trying to conjure up something that everyone hates. And, and everyone can see that it's just revolting and you want to be aware of. You know how you're walking along and you just want to make sure you don't step in that. That's, that's the sense, though. I'm, I'm being serious. That's a sense of, the, ugh, of what Paul is trying to convey to these people, to the Philippians, that this stuff is so bad. That mind frame and thinking where you puff yourself up and you put yourself above other people for whatever reason is as bad as excrement on the ground. And he says, beware of it. Do not go near it. I will never go back to it because it was keeping me from knowing who Christ was. Now, this is only one side of the story, young people. I, I want to show you that. This is the structure of chapter 3. And we're going to balance this out, but clearly the weight of emphasis is here, that he's so concerned this ecclesia doesn't fall into this trap. I don't think there were people in this ecclesia by the, the way that were teaching this, but there were definitely people coming through on the circuit, um, other Judaizers that were liable to corrupt this ecclesia and take their spirit away from them by preaching this. So he's saying, just don't, don't get into it. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 9, is confidence in the flesh. That's his expression. Um, And he talks about his Pharisee-like mindset. By the way, Pharisees are mentioned 99 times in the New Testament. This is the only time outside Luke, uh, sorry, Acts and the Gospels. That's it. That's pretty like, whoa, it strikes you in the face that Paul brings that up. This is the only time. Confidence in the flesh. In the middle, which we're going to look at, is is knowing who Christ is. That's the target. This is off target, confidence in myself, and this is off target too. These are the enemies of the cross of Christ in verses 17 to 19, and I've just used a C word so it fits, but I actually think it's a powerful word. Do you know what it means to capitulate? Just give yourself over. I'm just going to capitulate. I'm giving myself over. So maybe I shouldn't have used that word because it looks like most of you guys are like, I don't really know. But it's still, it's it's a powerful word to me because you could either... Have confidence in yourself from a pride point of view, or you can just cave into yourself and all your appetites and lusts and whatever, you just go with that. And Paul says, those two extremes will get you in the way of experiencing the real Christ in your life. Neither of those is right. Coming to Christ and knowing him is correct. Now, I want to, I want to just share with you a little thought. That, uh, and I'm just going to speak bluntly if that's okay. Right? Those two extremes might be presented in some ways as, let's say, we, we love to throw around in young people's circles and older ones as well, the terms um, conservative and liberal, right? Now, I'm not saying um, I, I can, someone who might see themselves as conservative is to the point of what Paul was <laughs> with the, all his little status things. It's not that extreme. And nor might be a liberal person as, as, as strong as an enemy of the cross of Christ. But, but I just want to just make this point as what Paul is saying in Philippians I think is really important. Those two extremes in our community, liberal and conservative, and we sort of box people and ecclesias into those categories, are totally rubbish. Young people growing up in the truth, we need to get rid of those labels. We use them for convenience because they describe certain mindsets that we might um, have an affinity with or not have an affinity with. But when you look at Scripture, neither of those is on the mark. Now, this is a whole other topic, but I just want to share with you, it just so happens that Philippians is smack bang in the middle of two other letters. Ephesians, then there's Philippians, and then there's Colossians. And if you get a chance on your own, you will find a very fruitful study and a helpful one when you look at the difference between Colossians and Ephesians, and Philippians is in the middle, significantly, okay? It's been said, and it's true, that there's over 40 passages similar between the letter to Ephesians and the letter to Colossians. In fact, people say one might have been copied from the other, 
Okay, they're so similar. Having, like, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, but in both epistles. There's, there's, you could list heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of similarities between Ephesians and Colossians as two different letters. And, and you might think, well, that's interesting, oh, Tim, big deal. But there's serious significance in that because they are written to completely the opposite audiences. Ephesians is written to those who are struggling with worldliness, walking in the darkness of their mind, chapter 4. Who's Colossians written to? What's the evidence in the letter? So off the top of your head. Those who are turning back to Judaism. And he's, he refers, you have all these laws. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. All that's in Colossians. Now think about this, young people. Those two letters are almost identical, but they're written to completely the opposite audiences. And the point is, you're both wrong. Legalism is wrong. Liberalism is wrong. Being spiritual is what we're going for. And now I I passionately feel, young people, I'm not concerned with conservative, and I'm not concerned with liberal. What we're on about is following and knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's his example we're following, then we're on the right track. Being conservative means nothing to me. Being liberal means nothing to me. I know there's different standards and different ecclesias, but let that not divide us, young people. We are about following Christ and being spiritual. And Philippians being smack bang in the middle of those two letters is telling us this is what we're aiming for. That's what it's all about. Please, young people, as we're growing up in the truth, let's not divide our youth groups or our cities over differences of opinion, however respectable they might be that lead to a conservative or a liberal outlook. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're aiming to know him. And we cannot be divided over those things that do not matter. Let's be really careful on that and realize where Paul is guiding us. No confidence in the flesh, but also no capitulation in giving in. We've got to be so careful. We need unity in our brotherhood, in our youth groups, not division. We need to be striving to know Christ together, no matter what ecclesia you're from. And those, those divisions exist in Adelaide. You all know that. They exist in Perth as well. And we know that. But young people, they need to be broken down. Not in the spirit of giving up the things that we stand for, but in the spirit of being united in Christ, because that's one of the most powerful things that we've been called to. And being divided over things that don't matter will not stand up when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's work towards unity, in humility, esteeming others better than ourselves, whether we wear a tie to meeting or we don't, whether we prefer one type of music or we don't. I was just having a fantastic conversation with a brother yesterday, and we have, it was awesome because it was just a classic moment of what the truth is all about. We have different opinions on, on the type of music that might be acceptable. And we had this awesome conversation. And we're still thinking, I'm still thinking, I'm open to discussing and, and chatting that through. But what we do know is that we both love the Word and the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're on the same track. And we're going for it. And we will not be divided because we have a difference of opinion over a type of tune or whatever. At this stage, I respect his conscience, and I think he respects mine. And we need that, young people. I haven't always done that to other people. But that comes down to the heart of this chapter. We are aiming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else aside, we are aiming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And those things will get in the way. Young people, I want, you to, just sh- I want to show you the other side. We've, we've sort of dealt with that, the, the pharisaical approach the Apostle Paul has and had in his life. But I just want you to skip all the way down to verse 17. Let's look at this bit here. Just for a second, because uh, if Paul is passionate about leaving behind his pharisaical old past, he's emotional about those who are giving in to an immoral lifestyle. Look at verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even... Paul's crying when he writes this. 
and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Enemies of the cross of Christ, young people? He's using a word that comes from the idea to hate. Those who hate the cross. They may not say they hate the cross. In fact, I believe these are people that still think they're, they're following Christ. But he says they're so deluded, just like I was deluded the other way, these people are deluded this way. And, the, and their lifestyle says they hate the cross of Christ. So look at, these are those whose end is destruction, whose God is their buddy, belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Now, young people, the challenge the Apostle Paul is, is this. Lest you think that because he's decrying a pharisaical outlook in life, in chapter 3, in the first section, that that means he says, just give in to your own instincts and appetites and everyone's self-serving, we're wrong. Life in Christ is not about serving yourself and giving in to your own desires. I think they're those who sit, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame is, a, is almost like a, a summary of those who just give in to their raw appetites and desires. Sexual and moral and morality? Absolutely. Just serving self and whatever you want and coming to the ecclesia not caring and, and not giving a, a care at all about what other people think? That's those whose glory is in their shame, whose end is destruction, who set their mind on earthly things, and this body is earthly. Jesus is going to transform this lowly body to be conformed to his glorious body. But right now, this body, if we focus on it, we're focusing on the wrong thing, our own desires, our natural thinking. That is an enemy to the cross of Christ, young people. And I'm, I think it's worthwhile saying, if you are a young pe- person who has the attitude that it's, it's just about me and what I want, and you've sort of worked yourself into this thing, like, I don't care what anyone else says, those people that, were, that I think might be Pharisees or I might put in that, that uh, completely fabricated box, and I'm going to do my own thing, you've fallen into the other trap. You are not self-serving. You are self-seeking, and you're not esteeming others better than yourself. That's powerful. And young people, if, you're a, if you are a young person that's just capitulated to everything sensual and immoral in your life, if you are stuck in sexual immorality, and you're letting your appetites drive you as if they are your God, then you need to realize you stand related to Christ as an enemy of the cross of Christ. We all do, if that's the path we're taking. An enemy of the cross of Christ, young people, is not someone who makes mistakes, who's not someone who who messes up from time to time and sins as we all do. That's not an enemy of the cross of Christ. This is someone who's set their mind, this is the route I'm going to take. It's going to be about me. I'm going to give in. And the influence I'm going to have on my young people in the ecclesia is going to be one that's not good. I'm going to push them to sexual immorality. I'm going to push them to self-serving. That's what me and my friends are doing. That's going the opposite way. You stand related to Christ as an enemy of his cross. Chapter 3 says, young people, that both of those ways are wrong. And we now this week have this opportunity to bring our minds to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether we have these little things in our hearts and minds that say, I'm confident because of what I do that I'm right with God. Maybe it, I mean, it's, a, it's a classic issue. I don't want to deal with it now. I respect other people's opinions and, and I have my own based on, on what I'm trying to look at in Scripture and follow Christ. But whatever the case is, if, if we do feel that, that showing up on Sunday morning in fancy clothes is what's God, what God is looking for, we are totally wrong. Absolutely wrong in every respect. The New Testament never teaches that. Jesus never taught that. The Apostle Paul would never endorse that. No one dressed up in the New Testament that we know of. And in fact, every reference to dress in the New Testament, the apostle is clearly saying, why do you think coming together is a time to show off your gold necklaces and braided hair? And how is it that you can judge people based on what they're dressing in? No. Now, young people, let me be very careful and respectful. I am not saying there is no place for having dress codes. No. No. But I think we need to make sure they're in their own place. They do not make you more right with God. Just like 
Paul's status and choices and external standards that he had as a Pharisee did not bring about righteousness. It only brought rightness from the law, not through faith in Christ. So be really careful. It doesn't mean that we throw all those things out the window. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I'm saying is make sure when you come before God, make sure as you're growing up that you know what God's requiring of you and you know where things fit in their place in ecclesial life. And you do not cut people off and judge based on whether you happen to be in the conservative group or a liberal group. Both are at fault, and we can't cut each other off in Christ. To know him is our goal, young people. What does that mean? Look at verse, look at verse 10. He's counting all that stuff as loss, dung, excrement, so he can gain Christ. In verse 9, sorry, be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And let's be really clear, you are only, only right with God when you have faith in Christ. That is the bottom line. Nothing else can make you more right with God. Your faith is key and your desire to follow him in faith. So Paul says in verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now here's the structure of that little, another little chiasm to focus us. And, and at the middle of this is the suffering and conforming, conforming to Christ. But it's bookend by his, his focus on the resurrection. Do you see what he does? Know him the power of his resurrection, being fellowship of his suffering, conformed to his death, to attain the resurrection. The, clearly the focus is the resurrection. But at the heart of that is an understanding of suffering with Christ, young people. Now, I just want you to, to be really clear. To know the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Apostle Paul's words here, is not to have a conversation with him. That's not what he's talking about. And if anyone had conversations with the Lord Jesus Christ, it was Paul. He did. He talked to him in prison. He talked to him during the journeys in Acts. Jesus um, came beside him and comforted him, and they had conversations. And, and Paul says, that's not how I know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's fundamentally important to what he's doing. But to know the Lord Jesus Christ is to experience him by doing his life, by experiencing his resurrection, by living a resurrected life, and by going through the sufferings that that requires, of cutting off the flesh, of not giving in to the, 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 the desires that you have, to suffer and realize that there's self-denial involved in the truth, in following Christ. To know the fellowship of his sufferings, young people, does not mean that we will hang on a cross for our beliefs. But it will mean that we have a desire to give up this world and all of its entrapments and to feel the suffering and the loss of that in our life to get that much closer to what the Lord Jesus Christ was all about and what he went through in his life for you and I. He left everything behind, young people. He suffered the loss of all things, even his life, for you and I. He gave up the world completely. He poured out his own lust of the flesh, lust of the pride in the... What was the other one? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He poured all those out. He gave them up. That, that's the sufferings of Christ that we probably now can relate to. To know, to know the fellowship of... Do you know the fellowship of his suffering, young people? Do I? Are you willing to give up and to suffer the loss of all things for Christ that don't matter or that pull you down, whatever extreme it might be? The suffering of Christ can be experienced in a young, purple, in a young person's life when they're willing to show humility to people that are requesting things of them. It's submission. That's the lesson that we learn in chapter 2. You can experience the sufferings of Christ when you are willing to give up things that are holding you back, the weight of sin that so easily besets you. That's what Christ did. Every day he fought that. If there's things in your life that are pulling you down and you're not facing up to and you're not willing to, to suffer some loss for Christ, you're saying you're not really willing to look at the cross and realize that Christ suffered for you. To know 
the fellowship of his suffering young people is to go back in your life, dig out all those things you're holding on to that have nothing to do with him, and to go through what it takes, not your own willpower, but with the help of God, the help of your other young people, and to put those aside and realize that life in the truth is not all about me. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and serving him. And you're going to put that stuff aside. And that goes along with the power of his resurrection. To know the power of his resurrection, young people, is to not know the facts about it, what day it happened, and all those kind of things. The power of his resurrection is for you to live and try to live a resurrected life. A resurrect. Paul says, I want you to present your bodies as being alive from the dead. As being alive from the dead. To experience the resurrected Lord's life and to know his resurrection is to keep pressing on to try and live a resurrected life. To see what that feels like. To know and be conformed to his death and also to his resurrection. And to, resu- to, to live a resurrected life, young people, is to put all of that pharisaical thinking aside and all of that liberal thinking aside and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. To be willing to look at your life when you go home from conference and realize that there's things you need to get rid of. There's things you need to stop doing. There's attitudes that need to go and to leave you. There's judgmental approaches that need to stop if you are going to live as if you're resurrected from the dead. To be in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and particularly His resurrection. Those two things are important. It's not just the resurrection of Christ but also his suffering. Both of those have place in the life that we have. Do you know, Paul so wants to know Christ in his life, young people, that I I almost think it's the only thing he was actually anxious. You know how in chapter 4 it says, don't be anxious for anything? But there was something that Paul was anxious about. What was it? It's an amazing, it's an absolutely amazing section. It's back in chapter 1. Come come with me, chapter 1. Look how much he loves the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, I still don't even know if I really get this passage from a, all it's worth, but just be impressed by it. Halfway through verse 20. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I, sh- what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I'm actually hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So I've just put it on a little chart, and this is what he's doing. He did, a, he did a plus-minus chart, okay? To live or to die, what's better? And he was, he cannot decide. He's so hard-pressed. If you ever get a chance, look up where that word in the New Testament is used, hard-pressed between the two, he's actually stressing out whether he would rather just die and and get on with being with Christ in the kingdom or whether it's better to live on and kind of live out the life of Christ now. He was so passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ that he couldn't wait to die if that was God's will because he'd be with Christ the next waking moment. But then he thought, well, if I live on, I can still live out the example of Christ and it will be benefit. So Christ will be magnified in my body if I live. To li- and by the way, the Greek is not to live is Christ. It says to live Christ, to die, gain. But he's on this, he's just so passionate about what he's saying. It's fruit from my labor. But to die is Christ magnified. It's gain and I can be with Christ. I can't decide. I really want this. This is better for me, but this is better for you. I'm going to serve you and I'm going to help you bring forth fruit and I'm going to encourage you in the faith. Young people, what a passion for the Lord Jesus Christ that the Apostle Paul had. Is that how you feel? Is it how you feel when you leave this week? That you so want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the the quote that Uncle Dan quoted from Song of Solomon. Amazing. That quote just gives the sense. There's this desire for the Lord Jesus Christ to love him and to live by him in all that he is. So young people, let's press on to know the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. We want to know him. We want to actually live lives that show that we're in fellowship with him. 
his sufferings and also his resurrection. And let's take on that spirit of the Apostle Paul to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to feel the power of his resurrection in your life. Because we're told in Ephesians that the same power God used to raise Jesus from the dead is the same power he's using to work in our life now. That's amazing. Let's feel that. Let's rise up. Let's know the Lord Jesus Christ for all he is. Hope you enjoyed that study which Brother Tim had put together. What we'll do then is we will close um, with a song and prayer. And the song will be coming up on the screen. Uh, We might need to work with the PowerPoint because it doesn't always seem to work first off. But if we could all please stand for that, that would be appreciated. And then we'll close with prayer afterwards. so thankful for the many ways that we have been blessed by you and we're especially thankful for this time that we have had together to look at your word to learn lessons about how we can be better for you help us to learn the lessons from philippians to not put our trust in ourselves and fall into the trap of legalism but also help us not to swing the other way and be servants to liberalism and servants to self. Help us to be guided by Christ and help us to look to him so we can be more like him. Help us to follow him in our walk to the kingdom 
as we build an ecclesia that will bring praise to you, Father. Help us to truly press toward the goal, the mark, so to win the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. We ask, Father, that you will be with all of your children around the world, but especially at this time we do ask that you will be with Sister Pam and with Brother Darren and with Brother Pete and Sister Jenny and help them with health and healing according to your will. Help us to always learn to put trust in you and to put our lives completely in your hands, knowing that you truly do care for all of us. We leave our lives in your care as we praise you now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>